It's Shabbos again. It's Shabbos. Okay. Not sure that all of you know who I am, because I'm usually like sitting over there. And if you don't have such good eyesight, you know, you're not, you might not recognize me. Um, and I, you know, might recognize my 20 month old son who kind of hobbles over and kind of grabs things. But, um, but aside from being a chazan, I'm also a musician. And part of how I became a musician was through being a traveler. It was about two years after college and I went to Israel for my best friend's wedding at the time. And after the wedding, I had a few months to kind of figure myself out. I was feeling a little dissociated and I needed to reintegrate and usually travel for me does that. So I was trying to decide between Morocco and India. And in the spirit of a true law-seeking pre-Romamu clergy member, when faced with big decisions, I went to visit a Kabbalist. His name was Rabbi Abu Sera, and his son and my brother went to Lubavitch school together. So after some Jewish geography and conversation and herbal remedies, he gave me for some ailments. I uh, asked him for advice on which country would be the better one to travel to. Where would I find myself? He said, he can't tell me that, but he said he's going to bring one of those countries to his mind. And then if I have that same country in my mind and we are like a tuning fork, then maybe that'll be a sign. And he wasn't sure, I mean, he just said that that would maybe be a sign. I said, okay. Um, I said, well, is it Morocco? And he said, yes, it was. I kind of had a head start. I think I knew his family was from Morocco, so I thought maybe. Um, he said, it doesn't really, really, really matter where you go. It doesn't matter if it's India or Morocco. What's really important is that when you, <clears throat> when you take your journey, that you write things down, that you remember all the places that you visit that you find your narrative within the place that you visit. And because the journey is not just to have a little trip, it's you need to be transformed. Every journey, you need to be transformed. So <clears throat> I did that. And I had my narrative. And I met, I met people and I made commitments and I told my story and it was incredible. And I made a very sharp turn away from being a guitar-wielding, angst-ridden singer-songwriter to an oud-wielding, angst-ridden Jewish <laughs> world music singer-songwriter. And that specific journey, I will probably tell you another time. But for now, let's get back to our Parsha, which is Beha Lotcha. Uh, in this Parsha, we are now situated in, this, in the desert. We're at Sinai. All these amazing things happened, and now it's time to move on. It's time for the Israelites to move on. It's beginning, you know, we learned a little bit about the menorah last week. Twelve tribes each gave an offering after the consecration of the, of the uh, Mishkan, and the Levites didn't really give anything, but this Parsha, they're, they're, they're actually lighting the menorah. They're learning how to light the menorah. And then all of a sudden, um, at the beginning of what the triennial is for this Parsha that we're reading tomorrow, there's something that happens in the Mishkan, and on top of the Mishkan, there's a cloud that appears on top of the cloud. The Mishkan, as soon as the Mishkan is finished, on that same day, it says the word, on that same day, and this becomes our navigational system. It's the GPS, God positioning system throughout the desk. I didn't make that up. That, that, that apparently is common knowledge, even though I, don't, I didn't know it before today. And um, <clears throat> in the evening, that cloud is kimar e esh. It becomes visible as if it was a fire. So when the clouds move, the Israelites move in the formation. There's uh, tribes on each end of the, in front and back, north, south, west. Each tribe has a banner. The banners have like mega banners. And there's trumpets blowing. And two trumpets that they're going to move. One trumpet, you know, one trumpet. It's like all these, like this whole really big, huge, beautiful, majestic experience. And um, the thing that I noticed about this Parsha and this cloud is that this cloud's different than the cloud that happened in Beshalach. Beshalach is the Parsha that when the Israelites are released from Egypt and they're in the desert, they're free. And as soon as they come out of the desert, they also don't know where to go. And they have also a navigational system. I always think that I'm just jealous of this whole thing. Like, I just never know where to go. I never know how long to stay. I never know when to come back. 
And I think this is incredible. I just feel like this is an incredible situation that they always know when to go and where to go. And um, in Beshalach, we have, if you remember, it's a pillar of cloud and a par- pillar of, of fire. And one moves through the day, the cloud moves through the day, and the fire moves at night. But in this parsha, I was wondering why Kimar Eish at night it turns almost like it turns into the fire. It becomes something else. So the the cloud turns into fire, and I was trying to figure out well why? What's the difference here? What happened between Bishalach leaving Egypt and this parsha? when they're about to move from Sinai, what are the things that happen in between that might inform us about why this transition happened? And so I started to look, and of course we know that the Israelites moved through the splitting of the sea and then the sea coming together. They received revelation on Mount Sinai, they received the word of God, the Torah on Mount Sinai, and after that they received instructions from God to make a, te- a, a tabernacle, create for me a space that I might dwell in, in there. So <clears throat> I was trying to understand how this molecular change in the cloud structure, this, this manifestation of God happened. And I started to think about when else was there a molecular shift in God's self energy. And it took me back to creation. And of course, as the Kabbalists um, like to say, um, as the Kabbalists teach us, the, the way creation happened is that there was a tzimtzum, a retraction of God's self-energy, of God's infiniteness, and creating a space for the finite, creating a space for creation, for human, for the human to be divine and to be divinely human in that space. And in that space, that there's, there's clearly some sort of shift that God had to go through within God's self in order to create that difference within God's self so that there was room for the universe to exist, for man to exist. And that spaciousness that happened in that, in that simtsum also created space for us to have a relationship. And in, in, in some ways, that's our way of understanding relationship. In the words of Gershon Winkler, he has a beautiful work, book that talks about um, take, um, the ground you're standing is holy. It's a beautiful book. And in this book, he talks about that the way in order to make space and relationship is, is, is something very similar to the way God made space for us in the Tsum Tsum process. And that's the way we also make space for others. And, and then I said the second, the second um, shift happens in this parsha where the two pillars, the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire, which were two separate entities, become one. So there's some kind of shift in God, God's self that the separateness, this guiding system that was two separate systems then became one. God's self became one. And the two events that, that, that I think mainly mainly um, bring us to that place is the word of God in the Torah, in the Revelation and in the Mishkan now the Revelation was also the word of God God was like us wandering through from Israel and telling us to go and telling us to come back and the word of God was, was kind of floating in the ether like it wasn't really somewhere but when God gives us the Torah, he starts putting down his narrative. The narrative of the story of, of between the Israelites and, and God, that story is in the Torah, and that's God's narrative. And once you write down the narrative, even though it's the finite words of the narrative, it gives us infinite possibility to move through those stories and to find our own stories within those stories and find meaning of who we are within those stories. That infiniteness becomes part of the finiteness. And so that story gives us a way to integrate our infiniteness and our finiteness the way God does God's self. And, and then in the Mishkan, God asks us to create a space for God, just the way God created a space for us. God asks us to create a space for God in the Mishkan for his infiniteness to dwell in a finite space. And so these two experiences, both of those experiences happen in the desert, and I think they really come together to, we witness God's transformation also to a more unified God. God is always one. 
God is always one. But the manifestation of the transformation of God from two entities, from cloud and fire to cloud that appears as fire, really happens in this Parsha. And it gives us a template for us to move through our own journeys. Our whole life is a journey. And also every journey that we take is a micro journey. And it gives us, each time that we take this journey, gives us an opportunity to have this kind of transformation. Have this kind of ability to integrate the different parts of ourselves that seem disparate, and also to integrate the parts of us that feel limited, and that feel finite, and the parts of us that feel infinite. And I, I think that is the, um, the end of my Dvar Torah. <laughs> I really didn't really have an end. You know why? Because there's no end to a journey. Our journey continues on and on. We're never supposed to have an end. Endless. The boundless, endless chesed. Chesed is endless, beautiful, loving kindness. And we're going to sing the beautiful, loving kindness prayer to end our beautiful service that was beautifully, beautifully led by Nadav Lev, Shai Wetzer, Beth Styles. The Shama Karlbach. And it's her love that wrote this beautiful, beautiful prayer. Let's all rise and we'll sing Olam Chesed on page 82.